Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and I am with someone that uh, you know is, has been nice enough to to give his time to the show a couple times, and the one and only Michael Grange of of Sportsnet. Um, thanks so much, Grange, for taking the time and doing this. Did Did you feel like yet any bit of break since the NBA season? You're writing about golf, like it, it, you're, you're, you're uh, I mean, yeah, no, it, it's been fine. I mean, it, it's uh, it's nice to sort of not be on you know, the schedule of an NBA team schedule and you, you know, a little bit of is, is just kind of making work sometimes and uh, just trying to keep up with things, but it's definitely a little bit of a lull and, and, uh, and it'll be, uh, you know, it's going to get busier here in uh, yeah. as we, late June and July and into early August it should be a pretty uh, busy summer in a good way. So looking forward to it. You have like notes for like Raptors free agency and Canada basketball kind of intertwined at this point with, uh, you know, like July 1st, a couple days away. Um, Just in my head, in my head, <laughs> all in my head. We're good. Awesome. Um, You know, you, you've you been on the Canada basketball beat for, for a long time and uh, of course the Raptors as well, but some pretty big news with the training camp uh, roster being announced and essentially everyone – you know, there's some guys that are unhappy they weren't invited, and I'm sure we'll get into that as well. But all the big names, SGA, Jamal Murray, uh, Wiggins, RJ, I mean, it's there's so many <laughs> Canadian great basketball players out there. What what was just your reaction to the fact that in the end, essentially everyone that anyone wanted to be there showed up? Well, I guess what was uh, a little surprising was that there were no surprises, right? And so... Um, I mean, other than than Corey Joseph not getting a camp invite, that was a little bit of a shocker, maybe. But um, you know, but when you look at players that they were really counting on, um, you know, they got all the key figures back uh, from the bronze medal team last year. And you know, I think if we had been having this conversation and almost any time since then, you'd certainly be hopeful that Jamal Murray would, would make himself available and be available and healthy. That seems to be the case. Um, you know, Andrew Wiggins has always been kind of a, you know, you, if he was available, there might be some conversation as, as to how important he would be. But I think Rowan Barrett put it really well, like when he's healthy and he's locked in, I mean, he's really good. And so, uh, if you presume if he's going to put himself out there and, and you know be part of this, and he's he's kind he's going to come to play and and typically Andrew Wiggins has played really well when he has played for Canada. So um, you know, and then it was going to be who else might you get? And and I think the way um, Andrew Nemhart obviously was you know always going to be on people's radar, but the way he played this season and ex especially the way he performed in the playoffs, he became a must-have. And, um, you know, I think that that he, uh, again, is, is committed in the air. That's great, right? And so I think you're at 10 essential pieces. Like, these are the guys you really, really wanted to have. And, um, you know, and then you've got another 10 guys kind of battling for two spots. And, uh, you know, you can go through that list of, of, of guys. And, and yeah. you know, a lot of them would have all kinds of contributions they could make. Um, so, you know, I think a very positive day for Rowan Barrett for Canada basketball generally. It, how much, like when you think about, I think in it's Steve Nash, when he took charge of Canada basketball, you know, almost a decade ago, talked about like, you know, getting that gold medal in, in 2020 and that, that didn't, uh, obviously come to fruition. How cool, like, I guess, how much of a testament is it to maybe the program that they were able to get everyone essentially that they wanted to to come. Like, what what do you think maybe changed compared to past years? Is it just as simple as it's the Olympics and uh, people love the Olympics and they want to play in the Olympics, or is there maybe something more there that they kind of got the buy in of of really everyone to to come and, and play for Canada? I mean, I think there's a few different things. You know, this crew of guys, um, obviously with Shea, RJ. Um, you know, Nikhil, well, like those guys were in before there was any guarantee of success. And so, you know, and I think I always say that like Canada basketball has done a great job treating the, creating an environment where, you know, high end professional athletes can come and feel, you, you know, 
comfortable and cared for. Like, you know, that's, a, that's a big one and it's expensive, right? <laughs> you know, all yeah. of a sudden you got guys making a hundred, $200 million. Well, they don't want to stay at X hotel. They want to stay, or well, maybe they do want to stay at the X hotel. <laughs> but they want to, you know, they want to, they, they want, they're used to being tra traveling a certain way. They're used to eating a certain way. They're used to being trained a certain way. They're used to, um, and all that costs money, you know? And so, um, the, that Canada basketball has been able to pull together enough resources to you know create an environment that's those guys want to be a part of is that's important the fact that they can create a somewhat similar set of circumstances on the women's side which is also important yeah. you know again that costs more you can't do one and not take care of the other um and then you know but then the final piece is is so people are welcome when they come and then but they want to come they want to compete they want to do something great that's you know within the player and um and then i think the last hurdle is it's a formula that's proven this work they had tremendous success in this qualifying process and at the world cup and you know so yeah people like to be part of a winner and you know who who doesn't want to say you're an olympian right like it's you know one of the great titles uh, any athlete can ever have so um you know so there that kind of gets you over the hump maybe with the last couple of guys and um you know it makes for some tough decisions obviously too um, I think Brian Windhorse always says, don't tell the players they're going to Leal for, for the beginning of the, the tournament, but Paris is in a bad place to, to go for, for the Olympics as well. I guess with that, you know, you, you alluded to it, but the, the kind of, the, they had the core 14 that was in place. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of players on this list that are presumably on the team that weren't part of that core and even guys at the, at the FIBA world C cup as well. How how difficult and maybe how challenging will it be? Do you think to to bring in a guy like Andrew Wiggins, Jamal Murray into that core of SGA, Dylan Brooks, RJ, Nikhil, the the seven NBA guys that were at the FIBA World Cup? I don't think it's going to be too big a problem. Um, you know, the Canadian, as much as the Canadian basketball community has grown and evolved, is still pretty small. Uh, most of these guys have encountered each other. Um, either training workouts, national team experiences growing up, uh, you know, AU basketball, like, you know, there's, I don't think any of these guys are strangers to each other. And, and, and conversely, I think many of them are very, very good friends and have a lot of history with each other. And so, um, when you're talking about the personalities involved, you know, Andrew Wiggins, you know, I've never really heard, I've never heard anyone say they don't like Andrew Wiggins, right? Like he's just, mm -hmm. you know, just a pretty chill character. He's not wanting to come and, you know, step on toes and and make a big deal out of everything. He just, you know, it's just, is Andrew going to come and compete or not? And, and I think all those guys understand, and I'm sure they were consulted. In fact, I know they were consulted, um, you know, on, on some of these additions, um, you know, they know, uh, players know, and they know what a guy can do and, and, and why it's important to have him. Um, Jamal Murray, again, like he walks into the gym again, he's familiar anyway, but He's carrying a championship ring, all kinds of, uh, you know, every, those guys all know what he's done in playoff games. And so it's not hard to convince. I think, you know, there probably will be some, um, you know, kind of smoothing out to do in terms of, you know, last year with that World Cup team, the roles were so well defined. It was Shea and everyone, you know, what can we do to, to support Shea? And now, you know, the, there's other guys, Jamal can certainly take over a game. Andrew at times can take over a game or parts of a game. And so that's going to be up to Jordy and up to those guys to sort of figure out the on-court stuff. But I think the off-court stuff won't be an issue. Um, and it's such a big uh, event. You know, you, nobody wants to be the guy who's kind of pouting during the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And not that I think that's an issue anyway. So mm -hmm. so I think from that point of view, it's, it should be it should not be a big problem. I, I guess with that, like just because of, of the, the the grandeur of, of the Olympics, I guess what are the expectations for this group in your mind? Is it like I, I keep saying gold? I think that should be you know what they go for. Maybe they don't get it. It's not a, a disappointment by no means. But do you think that's you know if you look at it, I see Bill Simmons and all these Americans, John Hollinger, getting a bit scared uh, about the USA playing against Canada. Do you think it's it's kind of gold? um as the mindset for this team well i mean they have one of the top five players in the world maybe one of the top three players in the world um and then they have you know a proven nba champion as your 1a so to speak 
and Jamal and another NBA champion in his prime in Andrew Wiggins. And then you have, after that, I think eight guys who were either starters or rotation players in the NBA. And um, no other team other than the U.S. has that. Uh, they do have some continuity. It's not as much as maybe white, but I mean, I think it's comparable probably to most other countries. And um, yeah, and they're coming off being the third best team in the world. So I, I think there's no reason why they shouldn't believe they can win a gold medal. Um, but, you know, and I'm not, you know, it, it's, it's, this is mm. a very, very tough tournament. Yeah. And, you know, you're in a pool with Australia who is, you know, I don't think as good a team, but they're very good. They've got a ton of history as a group. They're tough. Uh, you're in with one of probably Greece or Slovenia. You know, Giannis nice. or Luca. Like, I mean, you know, anything can happen. Uh, of course, Canada beat Slovenia with Luca last year, but it's still Luka Doncic. Um, and then, you know, then the other team in that pool is either Spain or maybe Bahamas. Uh, and, you know, it could be in a Poland, maybe, I'm not sure. But from the that other Olympic qualifying tournament, and Spain's obviously, you know, one of the top teams in the world has been forever. Uh, again, a team Canada has beaten recently, and um, you know, Bahamas is a complete unknown. But like they're going to be bringing yeah. some significant NBA talent. So you know, these are all kind of one game showdowns. So you know, I guess my expectation is they get out of the group, and then it's you know, hope you play great. Um, you know, I think it'd be really disappointing to have a team this complete and not get into a medal game. Um, but, you know, I, I, I it, if, yeah, <clears throat> if you play France or things happen, these yeah, games are 40 minute you. games and it's a short three point line and it's, it's wild what could happen. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, better than me at the World Cup last year. So, um, yeah, but it, so, yeah. I think they should go there with the mindset that, yeah, they can win a gold medal or they should mm -hmm. win a gold medal. They, and, and I guess my realistic expectation is play for a medal. And I think if they get into that final four, uh, it'd be a tremendous accomplishment, whatever happened after that. It, 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 and I'm sure you feel this way to some extent. It feels like it's, it's finally just, they've, you know, they've had the talent for so long. And I think you had a tweet about, you know, imagine 10 years ago, what, you know, Canada having like a medal worthy Olympic team and, now they have that it seems as though now maybe this will be the the kind of the onset of Canada basketball becoming more popular but also expectations that every tournament the men's team and the women's team who are on the rise as well go to an Olympics a World Cup and if you don't get a, a medal it's a bit of a disappointment yeah I mean I think um yeah it's a good problem to have I mean in fairness those expectations have been there for a while right like I mean and, um, you know, I think the tweet you're referring to is, you know, I think if you go back to 2015, when they just missed qualifying for the 16 games in in, um, in London, and 2016 was, yeah, you're right, Brazil, yeah. my bad. Hmm. And, um, you know, you look at the names, the Canadian, the kind of guys who've kind of filtered through, who are part of maybe that team in 15 or been in the NBA since, who aren't in this training camp, like let alone on the team, they're not even at training camp. It's staggering. You yeah. know, it's uh, like Nick Stauskas was number eight overall pick. Anthony Bennett, number one overall pick. Tristan Thompson, you know, is still an effective player in his 13th year. Corey Joseph, still an effective player in his 13th year. Uh, you know, you go through some of the young guys who, um, you know, aren't invited to this camp or, you know, in Omax Prosper and Leonard Miller and, uh, Den uh, you know, Delano Banton, uh, Eugene Omoro, Omoro, I'm going to blow his name. <laughs> Omoru, yeah, Omoru. Omoru, you. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah there you go. You know, those are guys who, who <laughs> yeah. you know, if if you had said 10 years ago, there's four guys who were in the NBA currently and none of them are going to be on your national team, not even on your train in your training camp, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It can happen. Yeah. And, and, you know, and then you got, um, Shaden Sharp and Ben Matherin, who are kind of ruled out through injury. Like that's an, like those 11 guys, Chris Boucher is another name. If you took those 11 guys and made them a national team, like they'd be pretty good. They'd be pretty <laughs> like, good. They'd, they'd be really good. Um, <laughs> yet they're not good enough in theory to, to be in this camp. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it's just a kind of an insane. Uh, I, I, 
paid for Canadian basketball. I, I think, I don't know if you said it, but, you know, for a while in like that kind of from 2015 to 2020, we, ke we kept talking about the Canada basketball community that we're going to cut an NBA or, and it, it seems in a sense that that time has come. I mean, maybe, maybe they won't in the end, but they have 12. Well, they have. I mean, they've already cut yeah. uh, Corey and, you know, it's interesting now Chris Boucher is indicating he's upset. He didn't get an invitation. Right. You know, Tristan kind of indicating he's upset he didn't get an indication an invitation. Um, you know, I don't know all the circumstances around that, but you know, it's basically based on what they put out on social media. I'm not an expert in interpreting <laughs> I emojis and everything, but uh, but the suggestion would be that they might have wanted to be there and they were told no thank you. And like again, I go to Crazy. I just can't believe it. Yeah, uh, that that's where we are right now. Yeah. Um. So, um, it's a good problem to have, and and it's, and it's, uh, you know, it's 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 not an easy situation for Owen Barrett, Rowan Barrett, and then Jordy Fernandez to navigate. But, you know, I think, um, you know, there's only twelve guys on that team, and uh, you can only, you, you know, you you got to be pretty. There's not a, a lot of room for warm and fuzzy feelings. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have to ask, I think it's like my duty uh, to ask you about the Corey Joseph story that you had. And obviously you, you had a chat with him after him being cut from the team. Um, obviously not invited to camp. Oh, not invited to camp. Yeah. You my bad. Um, just what, maybe just talk about that story and, and maybe is that something where, you know, you talk about maybe not, too warm and fuzzy with their feelings, Canada basketball to some of the players. Is that kind of just a shift and, and maybe talk about that story with where, where Joseph was coming from in terms of um, not being invited to camp? Yeah, I think he was legitimately very upset, you know, and, um, you know, I think just talking to some people on the Canada basketball side, look, they don't want to get into a situation where they're going out. You know, going at any of the players like they, they it's just not it, it's just an opportunity not an opportunity for them to do that um and you know i think if i think i think Corey at time you know he's in camp last year i don't think he had a great camp he had some back issues could that be because he wasn't in peak fitness um you know i don't know but uh the reality is you know when you go back to um, his time with Canada basketball, like I can know, I've looked at this the other day, like he's given up significant time in multiple off seasons for over a decade. And like, you know, these trips aren't like, you know, we're going to go to Indianapolis and play a weekend tournament. Like it's, no, China. You, know, I think, you know, you know, it's Argentina, it's Puerto Rico, it's China, it's, uh, Philippines, it's, you know, it's Mexico city. Like, for extended periods, like they, they take a lot. The competitions are long. The, the training camps take time. The travel is difficult, and um, and a lot. I think from Corey's point of view, I think his frust disappointment. He was mad. He was on. He was sad too. Um, is comes from a couple of things, and one is, um, you know, he's at a crossroads in his career, and he's very, very determined to extend his career and um you know and an athlete gets to that point and it gets really scary really fast i remember seeing Corey in uh in january in golden state and steve kerr couldn't say enough good things about him he was looking like he was set to become one of those guys who's part of a, a you know part of your your kind of leadership group um you know kind of bringing along younger players for years to come, you know, he's got tremendous pedigree, experience, personality, and uh, literally overnight, you know, he's he's traded and waived. Uh, the Warriors needed to save some luxury tax. They had a young guy coming up, and we gets traded in Indianapolis, and you know, they need a roster spot. And so, you know, I think that really shook, rocked Corey. I think it shook him, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's saying to me, he went and has been pretty much since that happened back in February, he's been working on his, his health, his fitness, his body, making sure those, these back issues are cleared up and um, is very, very hungry to compete. Mm -hmm. and so I think in that context, 
um, you know, for him not getting invitation, you know, I feel like he, you know, I think he should have had an invitation and, you know, he had enough money in the bank with this organization. And, uh, you know, I think part of what happened was when you look at that guard rotation, you know, I don't think he makes it. Yeah. And so you're stuck with, you know, bringing a guy into camp and no matter how almost how good his camp is, he's probably going to get cut. And how disruptive is that then? And yeah. so it's kind of, but you bite the bullet now and, and you make it happen, but that's, um, you know, again, I, I'm not faulting anyone for this, but, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm sure of course he was maybe going to do things over again. Maybe his approach last summer would have been a little different. I can't really speak to that exactly, mm -hmm. but you know, the reality is he's been there and he's done it. And, um, he wanted a chance to compete. And on that basis, he probably deserved one. But uh, again, we're just in a in a very unique space in Canadian basketball. Do you think it's almost because you look at Dylan Brooks, the, the way he played at that tournament and, and, and then translated into the NBA season, especially at the beginning, being so hot from three. Um, RJ Barrett played well at the World Cup and then with the Raptors was unbelievable. Um, that well, you now, go down the list. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Nikhil, who, who I think everyone who uh, was on that World Cup team, who went on and was part of an NBA rotation, had as good a year as they've ever had. Maybe a career year, like Nikhil did. I would say Dylan was. You could probably argue that it was maybe Dylan's best year. Um, okay. Shay obviously, and uh, Kelly had a really good solid year. Um, you know, I'm trying, I'm struggling to think of any of them. Who... Maybe not Powell just because of where he's, well, at. he wasn't in the rotation. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I mean, I don't think it's, you can correlate there yeah. and obviously RJ, you know, he, mm -hmm. he ended up starting really well. He had a bit of a, you know, those migraine issues in New York. And then when he eventually came to Toronto, he was great. So, um, you know, and, and if you talk to Steve Nash, like he would tell you like his, the foundation of his MVP all-star his all-star then MVP years were the you know the 99 and 2000 summers with the olympic team and mm -hmm. uh you know that kind of really was where he sort of was able to unleash his game and kind of rejuvenate himself uh, after a lot of injury struggles and um you know kind of i think arguably created a new level of confidence because you know he almost got that team to a medal game so um you know i think i think it's a pretty good advertisement for guys to uh to come out and compete in the summer mm. uh, i guess just kind of moving forward a little bit with, with the team of course like um i'm kind of curious that you talk about like sharp matherin like what is the like in there's a world cup in in three years and, and i'm not trying to go too far but you know they had that core 14 and then it, they had the core that kind of went to that went to jakarta and, and to the philippines for the world cup but now it's a it seems like a almost like an additive team this year with a couple more players. What do you think this has done to maybe change the future for players wanting to play for Canada in, in 2027 and, and hopefully they make the Olympics. In 2028? Yeah. Well, I mean, success sells, right? So now you're joining a program that's hopefully, you know, they're, they're going to come back with medals at consecutive events and, and, uh, you know, be celebrated for that. And so they want to be part of it. They know they're joining something, you know, I think in other years where you look at back, you know, that world cup in 2019, right. And there's supposed to be a pretty good team, supposed to be a lot of guys who were into, into it. And one by one, they dropped off. Uh, Corey Joseph didn't drop off. He went and um, you know, and I think, and you end up kind of looking around and go, what am I doing this for? Right. Like we, you know, you go over there, you, 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 you know, travel, China, travel to China is tough. It's a tough place to be for two, three weeks at a time. Um, and, you know, you go and finish 19th and or whatever they did and you feel bad. People, you know, everyone else feels bad. Like it's bad. Yeah. So that's not much of a sales pitch. Come and get your ass kicked. Like, <laughs> you, know, you know, don't worry. Everyone else is coming. They told me and then they all bail. Like that's, you know, that's now it's the opposite, right? So you're, you're going to in that virtuous cycle. Um, you know, I do think that one of the byproducts of how this has uh, gone down is it's going to be hard to declare a summer core again. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, the, you know, 
<laughs> people go, sure, yeah, count me in and then do whatever <laughs> they need to, right? Like it's it was an admirable concept and probably worth introducing. But, you know, when you look at, at it, you know, it was the participation was pretty perfunctory by most of the key guys and uh, or not at all by some of the key guys. And so, you know, and then you have, you know, multiple guys coming in who weren't part of the core at all. So, so I think, you know, that's going to have to be rethought. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think, you know, you, you maybe you get to, maybe you're in a point now where your pool is a little broader and, and the communication is pretty plain. Like we want you to be part of it. The more you're part of it, the more likely you'll be included and uh, you know, go from there and, and hopefully they'll have enough players that they can, sort of uh, function on that level you, you talked about like uh you know with the 2019 world cup and everyone just uh dropping out like flies uh at the end but how much do you think with not just this summer but really last summer that the fact that shea gilgis alexander said you know i'm in how much is that just a game changer for the program more than just even a couple guys saying yes but knowing that you know one of the five best players in the world is, is going to play and how that includes kind of brings in other players to, to want to play for Canada. Oh, it's giant. It's giant. And, and, you know, when Shea put his hand up to say that, like he wasn't at that time, he wasn't a first team all NBA player two times in a row. Like he was still, he was an emerging star, but um, you know, he wasn't, he, you know, he yeah. wasn't what we know him to be now. Um, but yeah, no, the, the it also helps that you know Shea puts his hand up. That means Akil's probably going to play. Yes, <laughs> that that's <helps>. true. <laughs> um, but no, I think it's 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 like in anything, right? It's it's uh, when your best player is a hundred percent committed, then it just is so much easier to look to anyone else and say, well, what's what's your excuse? Mm -hmm. And you know, let's the old you know Greg Popovich and Tim Duncan, right? Like, you know. He Tim Duncan got yelled at as much as anybody, and so what's an okay? Well, if he's yelling at Tim, I guess I better listen because yep. you know he's he's not going to be scared to yell at me. That's for sure. So, um, not that I don't think you know Jordy Fernandez is yelling at Shea, at Shea Gilgis Alexander, but the point being is is you know teams are are reflect their superstar, and uh, you know I think um, as good as and this whole core of guys like you've been around them, yeah you know, there's not a bad apple in the bunch. Right. And, no. and it much, uh, sort of, I don't know, a, a publicity or attention that Dylan Brooks gets. I mean, the guy's a great dude. Anyone who knows yeah. him is a great dude. People great love team, him. Guys, teammates love him. So, um, you know, and they've gone down the list, RJ, Nikhil, Kelly, like Dwight, like these are all just people you want to be around. Mm -hmm. And so I think it creates, um, as I said, it's, it, it just builds on itself. Um, I have two fun questions for you before I, I transition a little bit to the Raptors. And, and the first one is, uh, who is your starting five going into to Paris? Because I think that's like, obviously, there's two guys that are locked in and then the, the three other spots are pretty wide open. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I'd probably go Could Shea, Jamal, RJ, Dylan, and uh, Shea. I can't even count. Shea, Jamal, RJ, Dylan. And uh, Kelly, Kelly, okay, that's a pretty, and, you know, and that's going to be something interesting right off the bat, right? Because you know, I presume these conversations have been had. I, I'm sure they've been had, but you know, uh, how do you not start Dylan Brooks just because Andrew Wiggins shows up? You can't, yeah. um, and so you know, people need to accept that, and um, you know, and 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 if they do, then it should be uh, should bode for bode well for success but if it becomes a problem it's going to be a problem mm. uh and the other the other one that is i think going to be really interesting especially in those big games is at end of the game uh game on the line who who takes the last shot right because jamal murray made a bunch of buzzer beaters in his career and, and shay uh you know he didn't have a buzzer beater at the world cup and with well he has a couple with okc <laughs> but he he's uh you know pretty clutch himself too I, I want the ball in Shea's hands and um, I know he'll make the right play. And if our, if sorry, Jamal Murray is your lurking <laughs> on the weak side or whatever you want to do it, 
I mean, good luck defense, right? Like, what are you going to do? How many bodies can you throw at Shea and still uh, knowing that Jamal Murray is, is out there? I mean, it can work the other way too. And certainly Shea's a good, good enough shooter that that he's going to have a little bit of gravity. But I think, you know, the ball in Shea's hands with Jamal Murray stretching the defense uh, and then attacking off the catch is, man, that looks pretty good to me. It's it's going to be so much fun, and and uh, I'm going to say they have the best backcourt in the world. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna transition as best I can to to the Raptors, Michael. And and what was this season like? Just to cover <laughs> a team that was quite woeful for so long. How do, how do you find stories? What's that challenge like for you to, you know, in in March and April when the team's on a well, I, what was it? A 11, 12 game losing to fifteen. They or... lost nineteen out of twenty one. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, you know, it's kind of weird. Sometimes it's easier, right? Because you know, there's like there's no illusions anymore of you know, you know, you really it's it's sometimes you guys are a little more accessible and there's a little less going on, a little less uh pressure and earnestness. It's like, okay, yeah, let's 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 you know, let's talk. Uh, um and then, you know, and every season has themes and things that emerge. And, and I guess the, you know, the story I ended up doing at the end of the season on Grady Dick is, you know, that's, I was, I was really happy with that. And then it mm-hmm. was kind of a great opportunity to find a little bit of um, kind of ray of sunshine in a pretty gloomy picture. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then the way Grady's story his season went was, you know, it was pretty much a novel, right? Like it was, yeah. <laughs> started with great hope and uh you know disappeared into a horrible tragedy and then you know yeah. there was redemption right so uh kind of can't miss with that and um so yeah uh, i mean it's it gets pretty tiring going to games that aren't i'm not tiring like it's like believe me i know people have real jobs yeah. um so it gets a little like not it's as just, much there's not as much like electricity in the air yeah. let's just say on tuesday night in the 13th yeah. street or whatever but but um you know when you feel for you know, the coaching staff trying to, you know, keep, keep it, keep professional when, when things are kind of falling around around them. But, um, you know, it's, uh, the good news about doing this as long as I have is for, you're a little bit dispassionate, right? Like if it's, if guys are winning, Hey, there's great stories that you can tell that way when things are going in the toilet, there's interesting stories because of that. And my job is just to tell them, find them. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't, like it's more fun generally to be around teams that win because people are generally in a better mood. Uh, but you know, that's, uh, it's not, it's not as bad as you might think when they're losing. I, I remember, I think last time we spoke, you, you, I think it was right when the season had kind of started and Grady Dick had been, been okay. And then he, he really, I think plateaued and, and dipped after we spoke. There was no plateau. There was just... no plateau. Just the <laughs> fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I remember you were pretty, you felt just being around the team and, and seeing him work. And obviously, you know, him even better now, but that he had that work ethic and that things would kind of turn around. Um, maybe just talk about that conversation with him and, and maybe the kind of player he is behind the scenes and, and how you kind of believe in him just because you've seen that work um, and, and that he yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, he's, uh, you know, like he, you kind of, uh, it's interesting, you know, he's, he's basically within a, like a few months, he's the same age as my son. Hmm. And so, um, you know, it was interesting kind of seeing him and then, you know, through and then kind of through the lens of your, through the, through the lens of my, of, of a 20 year old kid. And, um, you know, and so on some levels, like it was like, yeah, like this is very familiar to me <laughs> and on other <laughs> levels, you recognize it these guys are really special, you know, and, and you kind of, um, they, they, you know, and as much as Grady comes off as and is um, a really sincere down to earth, good dude. Um, you know, he's a v- extraordinarily unique bundle of characteristics and traits that has allowed him to be, um, get to where he is. And, you know, it's not just working hard. Most everyone in that league works hard, but it's, it's, you know, working with detail it's, and it's, but I think the fundamental thing is just a, just a unshakable inner confidence, you know, just, mm. just 
just a belief that it's going to be fine, you know, because I'm, I'm, it's always been fine and it will be fine. And it's just, you know, and it, I think that belief gets tested obviously. And, uh, some guys crack, you know, I, I think it, that does happen. Um, but you know, the ones who, who make it don't and, um, you know, watching Grady you know, when he was struggling and this was concurred with guys who actually work with him versus people who just watch him work. Um, you know, there was never, you know, they, ne I remember talking to, uh, some of the veterans and they never saw his demeanor change. Like I said, were you ever worried? And they said, no, because, you know, he came into the gym, same guy, he put in the same effort, he put in the same thing. There was no moping and sulking and all of that. And, and, you know, I think there was a little bit of, you know, there might've been some kind of calls to mom, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, but I don't think he was, uh, it ever really became a problem. Mm -hmm. And so you're watching all that. And then, you know, when you see the little flashes of, you know, when he was playing well, showed well, you're like, man, this, this guy's got some real tools. And so I think what was really interesting there was, um, you know, when he, after he came up from the G league and he started, you know, started getting really steady minutes, you, you know, he shot the ball. Great. That's only, that's step one, right. That's going to be always is going to be his bread and butter, but it was very clear that he's much, much more than that. And, and, yeah. um, you know, and when we were talking about comparisons for him and stuff, you know, I wondered, I will try, you know, I said like Clay Thompson must be a guy you kind of looked at. They were like the guy that came, they came back with is Gordon Hayward and mm. not, not the Gordon Hayward. We've, he's kind of petered out, you know, four or five <laughs> years, but you know, the all-star Gordon Hayward, a guy who could put it on the floor, could create, could pass, could penetrate, could finish at the rim and could shoot. And, um, you know, they, they see Grady as, as a very well-rounded, all-round offensive player. Um, he certainly saw, showed plenty of signs of that, and I think he's going to be a really interesting guy to watch this summer at Summer League and into training camp next year because I think he's perfectly suited for playing with Scotty Barnes. I think he's perfectly suited for playing for Darko Ryakovic. And um, I think, uh, you know, he's – you know, he's at that age, knowing 20 year olds, you know, these guys get stronger almost by the month. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think he's, you know, you're, he's going to see a lot of benefits of a full year of professional basketball uh, when he, when he comes around in the summer and then into training camp. And and one player obviously who took the leap and kind of went through the growing pains in, in, in year two was, was Scotty Barnes became an all-star. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious, like you, I know you're three. You watched... you're three. Year, year three, two, sorry. year, yeah, no. I year two, no, yeah, exactly. Um, and and he's going into year four, uh, just to clarify for my mind. Um, but uh, you obviously, I know you watch the playoffs and you see the the duo of Brown and Tatum, and not that they're he's a similar player, but when you watch that, how do you think maybe in the his game can get to a level where he can be very effective in the playoffs, and and maybe what's those like next steps for him, um, to kind of take heading into to year four. I think he has to keep, you know, growing the stuff that he's was demonst he demonstrated at various parts this year. I mean, he's, you know, he doesn't have to be like an elite knockdown shooter, but he has to be like, a, I think the better he can shoot, the more it opens up the rest of his game. Um, you know, I think he needs to be a tighter ball handler so he can kind of, as the defensive uh, attention kind of increases that he can, he can manage it. Um, you know, I think I'd like to see him be a more, uh, I guess a more, I just a better sit down on ball defender. Like that's not something he does real great. Um, but we knew that already. And so it's a matter of him kind of committing to improving in those areas, but it's interesting you mentioned the playoffs. I mean, the one thing, and I I'd say the reason for so much excitement around Scotty is the guy is, he's kind of un, un game plan planable. You know, he, he plays with so much feel um, and so much uh, kind of just the ability. It's not like he's not a high IQ, IQ player. He, he obviously is a very IQ, yeah. high IQ player. But, you know, the, the level above that is is he's completely free and confident to break the script at any time. And he's you see it offensively he just goes and makes plays and he puts his shoulders through people and puts people in the basket and you know he's you know in the passes obviously so like that's 
you know, if the Raptors can build a team around him that's playoff worthy, I think he's a guy who should shine in the playoffs actually. Mm-hmm. And then of course the, where that's most obvious, I think so far is, you know, he's got some flaws defensively, but he is an incredible playmaking defender. Just incredible. Yeah. And that's, just, that's just instinct, feel, uh, believing in what you're seeing and, and, not even thinking, just reacting. And of course that incredible like collection of athletic <laughs> toolbox to make it all happen. So um, again, when you talk about winning games at in really tough situations, like it's, it's not about it, it, it. It's always about execution, but the difference is always the guy who can rise above when you've got two teams equal, equal, executing at a high level. And that's why Shea's great. That's why, you know, I think, um, Scotty's got a chance. Uh, we'll see if, you know, some of these other things come along. I, I think he'll need help. Like he's not a guy. I don't think you can just, you know, he's give it to guy, take everyone. Like he's not Luca, but, um, you know, I think he's, if, if, if the core around him is good, I think he can shine. How do you think this off season, uh, the Raptors will try to kind of build around Scotty Barnes. Uh, they have Bruce Brown, that there's a decision there probably I'd imagine they trade him in some fashion, but what do you think they, they do this off season, Gary Trent's a free agent um, and, and they'll have a bit of cap space to play with as well. Yeah. I wish I knew, <laughs> you know, they, they, uh, <laughs> they're not, uh, they're not in a situation now where they're kind of sharing a lot of their, um, their plans, which suggests to me, they probably are going to kind of work on some stuff. Um, they, um, you know, I don't get the sense that that Bruce Brown is. You know, I think they probably will pick his op, up his option, but I don't think they have plans to. You know, I think they they'll do that with an aim towards trading him. I mean, I'm not sure what that gets you. Um, you know, uh, the Gary Trent one is interesting because the. You know, like he's look, he's not a perfect basketball player, but what he does well is very very hard to replace. And certainly Raptors don't have any kind of obvious replacement for it. Um, but the flip side is, 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 you know, I think there's, um, you know, I think as much as coming to agreement on, on dollar and term with Gary is, is coming to agreement on role and Gary's just 25, maybe just turning 26, I think. So I think he's mm-hmm. not in a position where he's like, yeah, I'm happy playing 20 minutes a night and I'll do what you need for me. It, it, you know, I mean, he's always done that. Don't get me wrong. He's, he's, pretty pretty good soldier but um you know i'm sure if he has an opportunity to go start and and you know so-called bet on himself i'm sure he'd want to take it so um i think that's going to be a a tricky one because if he goes there is another good player not a great player but a good player with a very definable useful skill uh that leaves your organization for nothing and uh you know that's you can only like we've seen what happens when you keep doing that over and over again Mm. uh and as well they they of course have uh, Emmanuel quickly um, up. Uh, Do you think like, I'd imagine a deal gets done, but what kind of range are we talking for? I think it's going to be expensive, (laughs) you know, like, uh, (laughs) like it's a little bit like, you know, you see what's going on with OG in the Knicks. I mean, he's got them over a barrel, right? He's, they've given, they gave up a lot to get him. Uh, He's got, I'm talking about OG now, but it's true also of, of uh, quickly. But, you know, in, in OG's case, they gave up a ton to get him. He's very integral to their potential as a championship team, like crucial. And he's demonstrated that he can absolutely change games, win games, win playoff games. And, uh, you know, if I'm his management, I'm like, well, why wouldn't you max this guy? He's way better than a lot of guys or on max deals it's just because he doesn't go 25 points a night and so you know if i you know so to get it back to quick so in other words the Knicks are probably going to pay more than they thought they might have and probably more than they want to or someone else will and um you know quickly isn't exactly in that same situation but um you know I, i for the same set of circumstances the raptors gave up a lot to get them uh, they desperately need him. He is crucial to any kind of uh, competitive uh, on-ramp this team is trying to build. Um, and he's would be valuable around the league. There's a lot of teams I'm sure would love to have Emmanuel Cookley. Um, 
you you can't it's going to be expensive like you're not going to get a discount so is, mm -hmm. is that 30 million a year is it 35 i don't know but it's not going to be uh you're, you i would believe you're going to look at that contract and go wow that's a big contract mm -hmm. and uh but that's what it's going to take this is a bit inside baseball or i guess in this case basketball but i'm just curious how you think the new cba is going to maybe affect some of these negotiations because there is that um, second apron now and, and a bit tighter restrictions. Like, do you think we're going to see that this off season in terms of like a quickly no G or is it more? I mean, than a, a lot of people are suggesting that a lot of people think it's going to be a very busy summer because you've got teams that are either are kind of at or near the, that second apron and, and they got to try and get out of it. Like Minnesota is one, you know, are they going to be able to keep towns? Uh, you know, you kind of, there's a few other teams in that category. So there could be some players in play that, that wouldn't ordinarily, people might just eat the tax now, even, even if they want to spend the, spend the money, it's now it's really affecting your, your opportunity to even do business. Um, so there's that, I think it's kind of created, you know, very intentionally on the owner's part, maybe by accident on the player's part, I'm not sure it's created kind of a hard cap where you, you know, you pretty much are limited to two max guys, and as much quality as you can afford around them. So, um, you know, so that is going to, you know, going to kind of be a consideration. I think it should depress the market a little bit, but flip side is, is if you don't have guys who are max quality players, you've got to get them. Yeah. And so somebody's going to get paid. Um, obviously, you know, you talk about quickly RJ Barrett and we talked about how well he played for the Raptors when he when he got to Toronto how much do you think that is you know or the real deal that him shooting like close to 40 percent from three and just scoring every which way and at the rim is is the real deal and how much of it is maybe just a sh short sample size I'd imagine it's maybe a bit of a bit of both but how what, what do you think of RJ Barrett's game right now heading into yeah I mean I think uh I think I, I would say it, it's more likely repeatable than not. You know, it might not be quite, I, 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 I'd have to pull up his numbers, but I think he was close to 60% from the floor or something, right? Yeah, it was, it was something like that. Yeah. You know, over 40% from three. So seven, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, there's probably going to be a little bit of regression there, but you know, I think the way the Raptors play um, kind of got RJ a lot of, I'm not gonna say easy buckets, but a lot of opportunities to score in uh, in ways that suit him. And so, and I think you know, once the the you know, once you so he wouldn't have to wait for people all the time. I think with the next part of the problem is it's the balls in other people's hands all the time. He's kind of stuck in the corner or stuck on the wing um, and kind of waiting. And that's not really that doesn't really suit him. Catch and shoot's not really his game. Um, especially if he's not complimenting it with all these other opportunities. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm fairly bullish. I mean, I think he's, you know, I, I believe in RJ, let's put it that way. I mean, I, I just think he's, he's a guy who, again, you go to unshakable confidence. He's got, he he's does not shake. Nope. And, uh, you know, and I mean that in the highest compliment, right? Like these jobs, it's so competitive that if you're wandering around, not thinking, you know, you can do this, you're not going to do it. And um, the uh, and so a guy like him who has been through the wars, who's, who's sort of played in a market like New York, who's, you know, kind of had to fight for, you know, minutes and opportunities and shots and, um, you know, been scrutinized as scrutinized when he has got them. Like that guy's, he's fine. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so I think, you know, he's a hard worker. I think he's a smart worker. And I think, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be more inclined to see him be a 20 point scorer with a good level of efficiency than, than regress to maybe some of his poor, you know, periods in his, in his career when he hasn't played, scored as efficiently. Um, he's but, get, you know, but he's got to become a much better defender too. Yeah. Like another thing too, right? Like, I mean, you know, like everyone wants to be a winner, but uh, yeah. like one way players, Unless you are Luka Doncic, they don't win. And, you know, we all saw what happened with Luka in the playoffs too. So, um, you know, so that's – that's a, he's still young in his career, RJ, and he's got to really commit to and uh, accept the notion that he's got to be a, a much more uh, determined and consistent defensive player.
Hmm. Um, I, I thought it was interesting just how uh, Joe Maz and, and Boston kind of the everyone's opinions of him of him him flipped uh, after winning a championship, and that's typically what happens. But last year, people were kind of blaming Joe Mazzulla for the Celtics losing to the Heat in, in the Eastern Conference Finals. Um, I see a bit of parallels to some extent. I don't think the Raptors are winning the championship next season. But with with Darko Ryakovich, where, you know, a coach comes in first year, a bit bumpy, you know, first year on the job. And then the second year, they kind of learn the, the trade a little bit. How much do you think that might happen here with with Darko heading into to year two? Um, I think Darko, it's probably not how he wanted to do it, but I think in a way he caught a huge break. Um, you know, he basically he got a mulligan almost on his first NBA season as head coach. Nobody can attach that record to him. Um, and I think he, in doing that, you know, sometimes when a team goes south like that, the coach is part of the problem. Players kind of tune him out, quit, whatever it might be. And, and you know, you're, you're toast. Like you are what your record is. But I think in this case, you know, Darko got the opportunity to really connect and build relationships and, and prove to be an advocate for his players and have, you know, his development um, strategies, I think, were evident and and accepted. And, you know, and then when the results weren't there, through no fault of his own injuries, we all know what happened, um, you know, he he, he kind of gets a pass on that. And so this year he comes in with an, a year of head coach under his belt, which is huge. Another, you know, a full year, 18 months of, you know, uh, building out to the organization that the style he wants to play and the way, the way he wants his team to run in all facets. Um, and then he should have a healthy roster next year. Uh, that's a little bit better. And so, um, you know, do I think the Raptors are, you know, going to make the Eastern conference finals? No, I don't. But, you know, for the purposes of Darko Rakovic, could they win 39 games? Yeah, they probably could. You know, maybe 37, maybe 41. I don't know. Uh, but any of those numbers is a lot better than, what was it, 24? 24. So, you know, so, I mean, you know, like I think if he just gets his team in, you know, in into the hunt for the play-in, 10th place, 9th place, 8th place, he's he's going to look as like, a wow, this guy's really coming to his own as an NBA mm -hmm. head coach. And, um, you know, and, and not a lot of young coaches kind of get that grace. So, so I think in a weird way this year kind of um, worked out well for him. Uh, obviously the draft is is upcoming um, and the Raptors tried to tank and it didn't really work out or maybe it did in a sense for they have their pick for next season. Um, what I know they have the 19th and, and 31st pick, but yeah, I mean, you, you never know who they're going to draft. It's too, it's I'm too. Not, I am not going to sit here and try and no, tell you. No good or can't or might or like i'm just not gonna bother yeah I know. <laughs> there's just too many names there's too many, too many people names. i guarantee you they don't know necessarily who they're gonna get um so you know and 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 the one thing you hear about this draft just like you have heard i'm sure is maybe there's not the star talent but there's a lot of quality um kind of rotation level players dispersed maybe deeper in the draft and than some other years so you know maybe it's a good year to be picking 19th and 31st who knows but, uh, you know, the, the facts are this team has not, um, you know, found players outside of the lottery for some time now outside. of And and so that was the key to their success when they won a title. And, um, you know, they're going to need to hit on uh, these picks and, and add like athletic capital to their organization. Um, and if they don't, they're going to continue to kind of sort of flounder with that just how how do you think having the pick for next season now with obviously their pick this year conveyed to, to san antonio as part of the portal trade how much do you think that'll change or affect next season in terms of how they go about it will they tank for a cooper flag probably not uh but do you think that how much does that change the calculus for but messiah and bobby um it doesn't i mean i mean that's a little bit the problem with this whole scenario is, is they're going to be too good to tank. You saw what it took for them to tank this year. 
And it was, a, a you know, basically they completely gave up on the last two months of the season. Part of that was injuries. Part of that was, you know, tragedies. But uh, even in those, you know, even finishing two and 19, you know, they were, they weren't picking third. Um, so, you know, when you look at this barring a repeat of the kind of injuries they suffered last year, I don't think this team is going to be anywhere near, you know, the top, you know, half of the lottery. Yeah. Um, and so you're relying on the draft being deep enough that you can find a player at 11, 12, 14, whatever it is that can really be a difference maker. The facts are um, you're way more likely to find a difference maker in the top two, three, four picks of the draft. That's just how it goes. Boston just won a championship. They made, they, you know, Brad Steven as GM made every smart move you could make transactionally over the past two or three years. But the reason they're in that position is because they drafted Jason Tatum at three, Jalen Brown three, Marcus Spart at six, and then they hit on almost all their other picks further down the draft order when as the team improved. So, um, you know, so, I mean, I, I, that's just sort of my concern is, and it's not really a concern, like uh, whatever, yeah. um, but my observation is that, um, you know, it's kind of hard to build a championship team uh, without, you know, more than one star. They firmly believe that Scotty Barnes is their Giannis, their Luca, their, um, you know, uh, hey. Joker, Joker, like he's the guy they think they can, that can take them to the promised land. Uh, we'll see, you know, the people who believe that are way smarter about basketball than I am. Um, and then, but it's still more difficult to build, you know, to find elite players uh, further down the draft. So, I, I mean, if you were doing this by design, if you're going to roll it all back, I think they probably should have been tanked. You know, this should have been the second year of their tank. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you'd kind of maybe be at the top of this draft. You have Grady from last year. Uh, he's, and then, you know, next year you'd, uh, you know, hopefully you'd be in the, in the conversation at the, at the bottom end of a really good draft, but um, that's not what's happened. That's, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. And so they're going to have to try and figure out how to do it another way. Uh, the bright side is they've done it the other way before. So, yep. uh, so we'll see. I, I was going to ask you just, you know, to, to let you go and, Thanks again for for taking so much time for for this podcast. Uh, was just what is the hope? Like you know, it feels like it's been a rudderless ship for a little while now, just with everything going on. But is it is it just you you get Scotty? You hope you hit a pick at thirteen. Scotty, we trust. And Sc- <laughs> <laughs> All right, I mean, I think that's it. I mean, I think you know, look, they they have an interesting core of good young players, and Scotty is a, is he's a star. They think he can be a superstar you know there's we'll views independent of the team are mixed on that but uh you know i can i can see why they think it um and you know and quickly and rj and grady um you know that's a core of guys who should be able to stick together and play together for a long time and um that you know that's uh, in itself is hard to do so you know i i can see them being the path to being a playing team is not all that arduous Mm-hmm. The path to being, you know, a team that can go to the conference finals. I'm not sure I see it, but, you know, stranger things have happened. When When is Shea a free agent? I need to check that. that that's uh, Jamal that's Murray, maybe. I know. That's, that's, and, uh, that's, that's the hope, guys. We need OVO centers where the training camp is. Maybe that's the the uh the way to lure them in but um michael uh thanks so much for for taking the time and doing this um is there anything you want to you know i know so many people know you but is there anything you want to plug or anything coming up that you want kind of people to read uh nope. are you are you a golf writer now are you part of the golf writers <laughs> association uh, that- no i mean I, I love writing about golf it's day it's all day games so it's easy there you go there but, you go uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice way to spend a day but uh no nope, nothing to plug just uh looking forward to getting busy with the national team and uh, I'll be in Vegas for uh, Canada, USA and, um, you know, Raptor summer league and, you know, I'll be covering the Olympics in some capacity. Uh, so, so we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for doing this and uh, I'm sure it'll be a, a busy and fun summer for you and I'll be reading all your stuff and uh, thanks again for doing this. Appreciate it. Alex. Take care.